stuff in life that you can't control. And um, there's two kind of major elements of this story that are things that were completely outside of my control. The first is that um, I was born into a Pentecostal family. My dad is an AOG pastor. Um, and so that was kind of my upbringing. That's my churchmanship. Um, and the other thing was that I was um, born with a condition in my legs. And um, it meant that I wasn't very mobile as a baby. Apparently, I used to sit there um, to entertain myself. I'd get the Argos catalog, and I'd flick through <laughs> page at a time, get to the end, and I'd flick back. And that would keep me going for hours and hours. I think my parents were in for a shock when my um, brother started walking at nine months, and I was <laughs> still just sat there flicking through. Um, so yeah, I started walking a, a lot later, and um, I straight away, they, were, they could see that there were issues with uh, some, something was wrong with my legs. I used to walk on my tiptoes um, like this a lot, and I was getting physio and quite a lot of treatment from a young age. And uh, because of my tradition and uh, my, my, kind of, my dad being in the um, Pentecostal church, there was lots of opportunities for prayer for healing growing up. And I remember one time uh, specifically where there was a guy that had come in and done a, a talk. I was down in the kids' work at the time. And I remember they... Um, went and got all of some of the kids that parents had asked for healing for specific things for kids. And I remember being uh, taken upstairs um, and this, this kind of preacher came and laid hands on me and prayed for God's healing. And I remember walking back to my mum and my legs not being quite as high. So I remember kind of walking like this a little bit more. And it was really exciting because my the thought was that God had healed me completely from whatever had been going on in my legs. And a couple of days later, it kind of... Had, kind of gone back to walking like this. And so I knew that God could heal me, but I wasn't healed yet. And uh, it went on and I received, uh, I got, uh, I had an operation that meant that, so the problem was the calf muscles were too short in my legs. And so they lengthened those, um, which is great. So I could walk a little bit more. I was a keen footballer as well growing up. Um, I was not very good at football, but I was very enthusiastic. Um, my enthusiasm got me onto the school team um, and I was the super sub. I, um, I, was, I was so good that um, I got one Man of the Match award as the only game I didn't come on the pitch. Um, <laughs> and I felt a little bit sorry for me, but I got my Man of the Match award anyway. And so I was, I was very keen to kind of do, do lots of sport, but I just couldn't. I was, I was unable to do any sport. And so uh, the operation helped a lot, but I still wasn't 100%. And um, as I got older and started to kind of hit my teenage years and started to have... Uh, kind of grow more, there was, the doctor said that there's probably going to be some adjustments that the body does to compensate for the fact that they, the muscles feel different to the body now. And so there were. Um, and so the, the muscles in my calves are now too long. Um, the muscles in my thighs are, they kind of finished there. Um, and so it was just, there's lots of ways that my body was compensating for the issues that um, had been resolved, and that was a lot better than I was before the operation. And I continued to get prayer for healing because I knew that God could heal, and I really wanted that for myself. I wanted to be able to play football. I wanted to be able to run around without too much pain and be able to go on long walks and stuff that I wasn't able to do when I was younger. And so um, at Soul Survivor, I'd go Soul Survivor Festival most years growing up as a young person, and I would get prayed for every year faithfully, um, hoping that God would heal me this time. And he didn't. And every year it's the same story. And in our youth group, we used to pray for people regularly, that God would heal them. At church, we would pray that God would heal people. And sometimes I would feel brave enough to go forward, and other times I just didn't feel like I could because I was, too, I was struggling so much that God hadn't healed me yet. But when I'd pray for people, I'd seen God heal them. And it was really hard um, going through that. And then uh, I went to university, and um, I went through a, another spell where my legs were really bad. I found it was difficult to just walk to my lectures and back. Um, I went to see the GP and got some medical tests done as well. Um, and then I went on this student weekend away with the church that I was going on. And was, uh, yeah, they had a, a night where they were praying for the Holy Spirit, and they had a prayer for healing night. And I was like, oh, please, no. Anything but prayer for healing, because I know in my head that God can heal me and I should go forward for healing, but I really, really, really don't want to. Because if, it goes, if I don't get healed again and other people do, I don't know how I'm going to manage with that emotionally. And I remember um, 
standing up and eventually kind of coaxing myself up to, to get prayed for and kind of praying, going, I, know, I, don't, I don't even know why I'm stood here right now. I don't know why I'm going to get prayed for. And as I was being prayed for, I didn't feel any different in my legs. But what I did feel was just the most overwhelming sense of peace. I felt the anger and frustration that I had at God just leaving me. I had all of that, that I, and I wasn't even aware of it at the time. I, wasn't, I didn't realize just how angry and upset I was that I hadn't been healed yet. And I just felt all of that go. And I just felt such a sense of joy and hope for the future and that, you know, that God's love really was there for me. He didn't need to do something to show me that he loved me. He already had by dying for me. And I wasn't physically healed. I haven't been physically healed. Um, I, I'm still in pain regularly um, when I'm tired or I've done too much exercise or just sometimes it's a bit random and it's a bit rubbish. And I'm never going to be very good at football in this life. Watch out in the new heaven um, but, and new earth. But um, I, I know that one day that I will be healed. And that's a real hope for me to know that God one day, when new creation comes, I will have my legs fully restored. And that's really exciting for me. And I feel very, like, I'm so hopeful for that time. But I also know that God actually healed the bigger problem that was in me. My legs weren't the biggest issue. Actually, it was how I was feeling. And to get that, to receive that from God and to know him at work in my life in that way, it's actually been such a more powerful testimony, I think, to me, that I've been able to share in my work as a young, as a youth minister um, and to talk to people when they, when they say, God, why isn't God healing me? Why is he letting me go through this? And then I can share my story too. And so that testimony, if, if nothing else, has been um, just such a good thing that's come out of that experience where, where I felt God heal the real issue that was going on. So that's my story. Thank you, Jake. Should we give him a clap? That was great. Thank you. And we're now going to have some readings. So I think Jake's going to give us the first and then Sophie the second. It's already prepared. That's fantastic. So our first reading is from Psalm 34, uh, verses 1 to 10, which can be found on page 561 of the Pew Bibles. Psalm 34. Of David, when he pretended to be insane before our Limelech, who drove him away, and he left. I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. My soul will boast in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. This poor man called, and the Lord heard him. He saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and he delivers them. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him lack nothing. The lions may grow weak and hungry, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our Gospel reading is from John chapter 3, verses 14 to 21. That's on page 1066. Great. (laughs) 
Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men loved darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what he has done has been done through God. This is the gospel of the Lord. Let me firstly uh, just say a huge thank you. Thank you for having us. Um, I speak on behalf of the Wycliffe team. We've had a wonderful week. Uh, we will not go home hungry. <laughs> we have been in- incredibly well fed. We probably won't eat next week. Um, but it's been wonderful getting to know so many of you, feeling like part of this community, coming into home groups and homes and ministries and schools. It's been a real treat for us. So just to say a huge thank you for having us here. It's been a real blessing. Let's bow our heads together in prayer as we come to look at this Bible passage together. Mighty God, we do pray that at this time you would speak your word afresh to us. Give us ears to hear, minds that understand your word and the will to respond to your call. In Jesus' name, amen. My family and I lived uh, in America for 11 years, and during that time I travelled quite a lot with my job. And I was preaching one Sunday in a church somewhere in Texas, and was on my way home, and we got delayed at Dallas-Fort Worth Airport, and as I was sitting there, someone came over to me and said, there's a lady behind you looking distressed, perhaps you could help. I think they saw I was wearing my collar, so they thought maybe I could be of some assistance. So there was this lady sitting behind me, sitting on the floor with her back to the wall. And I sat down beside her and had what turned out to be one of the most remarkable spiritual conversations of my life. It turned out that she was upset because she'd left a bit late for her flight. I got caught speeding by the police, had missed her flight, had lost her uh, phone, I think she'd lost her glasses, and she had lost her temper. They'd had to call security on her because she was going to sort things out with the airline representative at the desk. In fact, she said to me, weren't you afraid to come and sit beside me? To which I said, I had no idea I needed to be afraid. (laughs) I went this conversation that went on and then she started saying, you know, the other thing that's really upsetting is my brother died fairly recently and only in his mid-50s and uh, I'm the godmother to his sons and I really don't know what to say to them. And I said, well, my father died when he was in his mid-50s, 57. And for me, that was one of the times I felt closest to God. So we had a conversation about that. And then she said, look, I know I'm struggling with this problem of anger. I have been to counselling, but that really didn't shift it very much. So I said, well, these are big, big challenges. We really need God's help to shift things as difficult as that. I said, look, I'm reading a book at the moment, and there's a prayer in here, which is a very powerful prayer of surrender, saying, God, I need your help. Come into my life and guide me through. I showed her the prayer. She read it. And I said, have you ever prayed a prayer like that? And she said, no. So I said, would you like to say that prayer? And she said, no, which I was very surprised by. But then she said something which I will always remember. Let's call her Lucy. She said, The thing is, you see, I'm angry Lucy, and if I pray that prayer, I don't know who I will become. Well, I said, that's absolutely fine. You can take the book away, and maybe some other time. You might want to make that prayer a prayer of your own. Then I said, well, on the other hand, if you'd like, we could pray that prayer together. Oh, she said, I'd like to do that. Again, that surprised me. This is real life. 
So we sat together, there we were, I think maybe Dallas, Fort Worth Airport, gate D8 or something. <laughs> lots of tears, lots of drama. Must have been quite a spectacle. The Lord was doing something wonderful for this lady. So we sat down and we said that prayer. We said some other prayers. And then we stood up and she started sort of bouncing on the spot. Like, you know, a weight had been lifted from her. Glowed a little bit. Then she looked, looked across at the airline representative and she said, you know what? I was about to go and punch her out. Unless security got there first. But he said, I don't want to do that anymore. I feel compassion for her. And then she gave me a big hug. And then she went to the man behind me in the line and she gave him a big hug. He was very surprised. <laughs> I remember him still. He's an IT consultant heading back to Pittsburgh. He took it very well. Anyway, anyway we were, the flight was about to take off. We were heading off to the gate. And she was, must have borrowed a phone. She's on the phone to her husband. And I said, look, we've got to go now. She said, I'm on the phone to my husband. He thinks I'm drunk. I said, we've had this problem before. <laughs> Acts chapter 2, Pentecost strikes again. Amazing conversation. But what we have in this gospel reading is another one of these moments when there's a spiritual conversation taking place of great significance. Nicodemus, who comes across so well in his story, he's clearly regarded as a leader amongst his own people. He's a teacher. And he's come to Jesus by night to work out what is going on. Tell me about this teaching. Very commendable what he's doing. And in the middle of that conversation, we have one of these most remarkable things that Jesus said. In fact, probably now become one of the most quoted verses in the whole Bible. John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. It's an amazing summary of the Christian message. And it talks about this lovely sense of tasting and seeing that the Lord is good, as that angry Lucy did that day at Dallas-Fort Worth Airport. For God so loves the world. He loves the world. Doesn't mean he just loves the lovely countryside and he enjoys a lovely sunset. And it's quite fun watching the glories of nature. He's talking about the people of the world. He loves everybody on planet Earth. No matter what nation, what age, what background, what abilities, he loves us all. I remember in that conversation with Angry Lucy, one thing she said to me, do you really think God loves me? I said, I think he does. And we believe that because the Bible says so. Jesus says so. We've got it right here. God loves the world. It's right here. Only recently I came across a verse, I know it's well known to many, but it came as a complete delight to me. Somehow I've missed it all these years. Zephaniah chapter 3 and verse 17. The Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love and he will rejoice over you with singing. I've never had anybody rejoice over me with singing. <laughs> Sounds like the Almighty is. Are you warming to him? And he shows it in his gifts. One of the great love languages, isn't it? The gifts. And the first thing is he's given us the whole world to enjoy. He has given us all things richly to enjoy. Bible verse. A little testing question for you. What was, going back to the Garden of Eden, what was the price of fruit in the Garden of Eden? It was all free. <laughs> Everything was being given away. This is the character of God. He shows his love in every meal, in every drink, in every breath, in everything, every good gift we have. It comes from God because he loves us. But most significantly here, God so loved the world, he gave his only son. It's not enough he'd given us this wonderful world to inhabit and enjoy and care for and rule over properly. He saw the absolute catastrophe we were making of it and he comes on this amazing rescue mission. God sent his son because he loves us and he saw that we were destroying the entire thing and destroying ourselves in the process. He's come on this most amazing rescue mission because he loves us. 
Now, as the Bible passage goes on to say, yes, but we prefer the darkness. We want to keep the light out. But he still loves us. And he still goes on patiently saying, yes, but tell everybody. Get the word out. I love you all. I'm giving you these daily gifts. I've sent you my son. Please come back. I love you. But then the lovely Bible verse goes on for to all who believe in him. May his name not perish, but have eternal life. So God is concerned about our mortality. We've got so used to it, we can't take it for granted. But it turns out God is against sickness and sadness and suffering and death. They are intruders in God's good world. And Jesus has come to root them out. And one of the little hints God likes to give us to help us believe these things in a world where this seems now so normal, from time to time he breaks in with a healing miracle. Now, of course, every time there's healing through the medical profession, we rejoice. God has made the world in such a way we can do the science that helps us to do the work that helps us to find healing. Praise God. But from time to time, he likes us to break in and say, I can do this for you. I'm going to heal the sick. What the great C.S. Lewis calls an outbreak of normality. (laughs) That's how it's supposed to be all the time. Please do not give in to the world of sickness, sadness, suffering and death. It's a temporary crisis. Protracted misery, but it will come to an end, says Jesus. And his first coming is a proof he's going to do a second coming when the entire mess is sorted out. But in the meantime, he's saying, I want you to get the word out. I love you and I want you back. I want you to believe in me. So you find this new and eternal life. But I say one of the ways in which God just keeps reminding us of his love and of his eternal purposes, and he's against sickness, as he is against suffering and sadness and death, he brings these occasional healings. First time I came across a healing miracle in the church where I grew up, where they frankly were not very Pentecostals. It wasn't an Assemblies of God church. A bit more conservative than that. And I never heard anyone talk about healing prayer. Until a friend of mine in youth group, her dad was getting very sick to the point of death. Now he was a GP, his wife was a GP, they knew they'd been through the whole medical profession and there was nothing else they could do. But they knew their Bibles, James chapter 5, if any of you are sick, let them call the elders to anoint with oil. So they did. And so sure enough, the minister and a team of uh, elders came and prayed with him. And he was completely healed. And he lived for years afterwards. His youngest son was so astonished, he became a Christian himself. He'd seen it. One day his dad's dying, and the next day he's up and about. Doesn't happen every time. We've just been hearing that. I don't know why sometimes it does happen and why sometimes it doesn't. But the fact that it happens at all is a little reminder, I can do this. One day this whole crisis will come to an end. And things will be put to right. We'll see the new heavens and the new earth the way God really wants it. Not this mess, that glory. And what we're called to do is to believe in him. Now, Jesus very helpfully explains it. He gives a sermon illustration. Preachers like me are awfully grateful when Jesus actually puts a sermon illustration on the plate for us, as he does here. And he refers to the book of Numbers. Because, of course, Nicodemus would know it. He tells a story about a time when there was a crisis, the Hebrew people rebelling against God, they were sinning, and so God sent serpents in to remind them that sin leads to death. It's a crucial message. The world forgets it at its peril. Sin is not fun, at least if it is, it's only temporary. Sin leads to death. But they cried out, asking for God's mercy. And so God said to Moses, make a serpent, either copper or bronze, not quite clear, put it on a stick, whoever looks up to that serpent on the pole, they will be healed. They will be saved. Not because they got their lives sorted out, but because they put their trust in a God who heals and who saves. And everyone who did, they were saved. But again, what was going on there? What Jesus is indicating here is pointing forward to him. One day Jesus himself will be raised up on a pole, the cross, So all those things that are killing us would kill him, so they don't have to kill us. At least not eternally. Death can become the gateway to glory. 
It's an astonishing thing. But we've got to believe. That's one of the things I've bumped into, bumped into some doctors in this world, in this uh, congregation, and I'm sure many of you have met doctors or had to go to doctors down the years. If you believe in your doctor, it doesn't mean you believe they exist. We're going to take that for granted. It means you'll take the medicine they suggest or get the surgery they're suggesting. That's when you show you believe. And so how do we show that we believe in Jesus? How do we show we believe that he really does love us? That he really has done what's necessary for our forgiveness? That he really will send the Holy Spirit into the life of anyone who asks? We believe it and we receive it. I thank you for your love, O Lord. I receive it. I thank you for your forgiveness. I receive it. I thank you for the Holy Spirit. Send him in. I need the help. That's what we're talking about. That's faith. We believe it and we take hold of it. And what we do, we look to the cross and say, that's where the healing takes place. And that's a wonderful thing I saw going on on Angry Lucy's life on that amazing day. Dallas Fort Worth Airport. One of the most dramatic moments I've ever seen. It's not always like that, folks. You can put your faith in Jesus and it looks like a steady progress from there, or it looks like ups and downs. I am not promising we're all going to have an angry Lucy experience tonight. All I am saying is what you see in those moments, as what you see in these dramatic healing moments, is God can do it. He normally does it slowly. But he can do it. There's nothing he can't do. We're going to be calling upon God later for healing. We know he can heal it. He can heal absolutely anything, absolutely anywhere, absolutely any time. When Jesus visited the hospital ward, so to speak, of his own day, he sent them all home. You can go home now, it's all done. He's not promising he's going to do that every time. But he does say, ask. He does say, ask. We're going to do, follow Jacob's example here. Just keep on asking and see what he would do. And maybe we get a different answer to prayer. Maybe it's going to be peace that we really need. Or joy or some relief or something else. But if we come and say, I want healing, it's not going to do you any harm. And it might do you some marvellous good. What we're going to do in, in a moment, I've got a prayer here, very similar to the one I prayed with Angry Lucy. I found it, you've got it in your Why Jesus booklets. There are some over there, some here, I know some all around the church. I'm going to read out the prayer. It's a very powerful, simple prayer of surrender. Probably one of the most powerful prayers you can ever pray. Something like this. Lord Jesus Christ, I'm sorry for the things I have done in my life. Please forgive me. I now turn from everything which I know is wrong. Thank you that you died on the cross for me so that I could be forgiven and set free. Thank you that you offer me forgiveness and the gift of your spirit. I now receive that gift. Please come into my life by your spirit to be with me forever. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. I prayed a prayer like that when I was seven. No dramatic events, but it certainly means I've had Jesus in my life since then. Have you ever prayed a prayer like that? Are you ready to pray a prayer like that? Now, it could be you're just walking off the streets, you had no idea there's going to be a preacher like me up the front, so it's going to be a nice, quiet evening. <laughs> and you better just quietly go on your way afterwards. May I say, if you're not ready, if you're not ready to say a prayer like that, that's okay. But please do take a Why Jesus booklet and put this at the top of your to-do list. Because if we're right, there couldn't be anything more important you could be doing. If you're not ready, give it time, count the cost. Because like Angry Lucy said, she won't be Angry Lucy anymore. Changes are coming. But if we change for the better, let me just say your family and friends will thank you for it. (laughs) But what I'm going to do in just a moment, I'm going to say that prayer. I'm going to give you a chance to echo it back in the silence of your own hearts. And then what we're going to then do, when we come to communion, I'm going to give you a chance to do something a bit more physical. It's entirely optional, of course. But I know I found this has been helpful to other people. When we come to the rail, if you want to say, I'm in, I'm ready, I perhaps have never done this before, but I put my faith in Jesus tonight. He is my Lord, he is my saviour, I'm in. Just put your hand up in front of you when you come to the rail. Even if you're not coming for communion, anyone can come up. And I'll say a prayer that you'll know the forgiveness of all your sin. 
you'll be filled with the Holy Spirit and that you'll follow Jesus faithfully all the days of your life. And then you can carry on and have communion or you can simply go back to your seats or indeed you take communion and then you can go back and there'll be people available to pray with you. Again, if this has been a spiritual significant moment, have a chat with those people. They'd love to pray with you. Or if you want healing of body or mind or spirit, just go to them. It's anointing with oil and then people who will pray with you in a bit more detail. If you've got a prayer request, take it to them. We'll see what the Lord will do. He won't do any harm, I promise you that. Let's just be still for a moment. I'm going to say this prayer. I'll give you a chance to echo it back in the privacy of your own hearts. Lord Jesus Christ, I'm sorry for the things I have done wrong in my life. Please forgive me. I now turn from everything which I know is wrong. Thank you that you died on the cross for me so that I could be forgiven and set free. Thank you that you offer me forgiveness and the gift of your spirit. I now receive that gift. Please come into my life by your Holy Spirit to be with me forever. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen.